joy to be here and looking forward to this, uh, being able to address something that's incredibly dear to me, but I got to get rid of his notes and get my own here. I have five parts to this talk, dear people. I hope to be done in about 45 minutes. Five uh, parts. The first part of this talk, my first uh, part is going to be 15 minutes of nap time. <laughs> For those of you on the planning committee, if you're going to do this annually, I suggest right after lunch, have adoration. <laughs> huh, Jesus is secure. You fall asleep on him, it doesn't bother him. But I'm insane. If you fall asleep on me, it hurts my feelings, so stay awake. No, the, the, first, the first part of my talk is to establish the need for evangelization. I trust with this crowd that's not going to take a lot of convincing. But I want to throw out some real numbers and some real facts to establish and for you to feel deeply our profound need to evangelize. we got to feel it. The way we feel the need for a doctor when we have cancer the way we feel the need to, for water when we're thirsty, we got to feel the need to evangelize. That's the first part. The second part, I just want to lay out a simple vision of evangelization. Father uh, Donio and the rest, uh, some other speakers so far have said some things that I will touch on and uh, will repeat, but uh, hopefully there will be a little something new there. Third part, I want to cover two major obstacles that need to be overcome in order to effectively evangelize. And then fourth, four action steps. Four basic steps I see required to evangelize. And then for my fifth point, I'm going to talk about whatever the heck I feel like at that point. <laughs> Those are the five parts. But before I begin the uh, go into my first part, I need to give Paul more time to straighten out this mic. So I'm just going to say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and other things like that. No, I want to talk about the origin of this address I'm about to give you because it's important and it speaks to the very essence of what evangelization all of, is all about if it's truly Christian evangelization. There are a couple of words in the Catholic faith that for years were terribly unexciting to me. Terribly unexciting to me, like stewardship. <laughs> that word has always just like been bland for me. And then I got a bishop whose focus was stewardship for about 10 years. <laughs> the second one was vocations, vocations. I just found it to be such a bland, unsacred bite to the word. And then I was vocation director for 11 years. <laughs> the third word, which never ever really, you know, uh, grabbed me was evangelization. It's just never a word that's fired me up until 2015. A dear woman named Michelle Dupont was the director of faith formation for the Diocese of Bismarck. And I was at the cathedral at the time, just down the street. She had been a focused missionary at some point, but her whole life and what uh, drove her from being a little girl all the way into uh, the end of her life was evangelization. She was just fired up about evangelization all the time. And I had the great privilege for a couple of years to uh, direct her spiritually. Well, on uh, what, the end of December 2014, she was about 28 years old, I think, 28, 29, um, close to, to being engaged to be married and diagnosed with cancer. Exactly one year later, she died. After a long, painful, painful battle with cancer that ate her alive. I didn't even recognize. I would have not known who she was if, in fact, I hadn't seen her gradually uh, go through this. It wasn't until after she died 
that all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'm attracted to the, to the word evangelization and the concept. And so I just start writing bulletin articles. I just started writing bulletin articles at the cathedral. I thought I was going to write one or two or three. It just kept coming out. I wrote 20 bulletin articles on evangelization. I would have been bored after one. <laughs> and that's what that's, uh, was the origin of this booklet and the origin of this address. Now, what I want to hold up to you and what I want you all to consider, I think that was from the fruit of her redemptive suffering. I was evangelized by her. Jesus says, when I'm lifted up on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. Dear people, get this silly program notion idea of evangelization out of your head and understand that what makes an, evan uh, an effective evangelizer fundamentally is knowing how to receive love from God through the exercise of faith at the cross. That's the good news. The good news is all the bad places before Jesus are now the places where we receive love from, the, from God, where the encounter happens. You want to be good at evangelizing? Don't suffer alone. And bring your heart to God where love is being poured out. And if you taste the presence of the loving God being poured out to you where you suffer, you'll evangelize like crazy. That's what evangel is the fire behind evangelization. It is the cross that blew open the good news. A heart that knows how to receive love from God at the cross. In my trials, where I can't change what I'd like to change, where I can't cause what I'd like to cause. And right there is where I turn and I hold my heart to God and he pours in it. And that's the good news. I haven't started my talk yet. <laughs> Listen, evangelization is not a heady thing. It is a heart that knows where God, that God pours into me in my need. And my heart loves him. But if I don't know how to do that, if at the cross I turn in on myself and I'm self-pitying and I lose faith and I don't believe God is good there and this is where salvation happens, then the fundamental message of Christianity, I don't even know. I have not yet been evangelized. Which brings me to my last little point before I begin my talk. <laughs> we, have to, we have to stand in awe of the profundity of the church naming St. Therese of Lisieux as the, patient, as the patroness of missionaries. A woman who died at the age of 23 and didn't leave the cloistered monastery from the age of 15 to 23, and she is the patroness of missionaries. It is a heart close to the heart of Christ that is an evangelizer. And a heart comes close to Christ by knowing how to receive what he is pouring out to me at the cross. That's good news. And that 
If anybody's going to get serious about evangelizing, needs to get serious about that. Now on to my top. So uh, the need for evangelization. First, some numbers quickly, everyone. Um, these are hard to put together. I think I'm being conservative with these numbers, right? But I, th I think we can all agree, right, that 50 years ago, more than 50% of all Catholics attended uh, Mass regularly, uh, Holy Days of Obligation Sunday Mass. I think we can easily say 50%, according to the numbers. They differ, but for the most part, I think one is conservative by saying that 50 years ago. Now the numbers seem to suggest that we're below 25%. In 54, 50 more years, imagine 12 and a half. But it gets, it, it gets worse. If you're not deeply uh, discouraged yet, you wait. I'm going to get you there, I promise. <laughs> the millennials, as Father Donio mentioned today uh, briefly, huh? the millennials, according to the numbers, according to Sherry Waddell, Intentional Disciples, 10% huh? go to Mass. 10 and that's our next generation. That's, our next, that's the next leaders of the church. Huh, they were born in 1985. They're not young anymore. They're 33 years old. They're the ones forming our families, passing on the faith. And 10% go to church. Wait. It gets worse. Marriage. Listen to marriage. In 1972, I just opened the Kennedy directory, the big brown book with all the stats. In 1972, and this is consistent. I didn't go through and find a couple of aberrations. These are consistent numbers. In 1972, there were 415,000 Catholic couples who received the sacrament of matrimony. In 1972, in America, 415,000 Catholic couples received the sacrament of matrimony. In 2010, and, it gets, and, and it's declined uh, since, in 2010, 168,000 Catholic couples received the sacrament of matrimony. 415 to 168 in less than 40 years. Slashed way more in half. And... In that same time, from 72 to 2010, the Catholic population increased by 17 million. I trust you get my subtle point that lay people, not priests, are the problem. In case you missed that subtlety, that was pretty explicit. <laughs> in all seriousness, in all seriousness, if in fact the sacrament of holy orders would be suffering the same decline that marriage is, we would be in tremendous trouble. The numbers to the priesthood have not declined the way marriage has. We need to fill the desperation to evangelize. And so we have to turn the ship around, and we can't and we won't unless lay people feel seriously their Christ-given, not church-given, not bishop-given, not pastor-given, Christ-given mission and duty to evangelize. And privilege, of course. It's not an option. This mission comes from Jesus. And anybody who receives from the heart of Jesus tastes this mission. It's not optional. Being an usher at Mass is optional. Unless you go to my parish. <laughs> then these things become less and less optional. Listen, dear people, you can go to heaven without being an extraordinary minister of the Holy Eucharist. You can go to heaven without being a lector. You can't go to heaven without evangelizing. I trust I got your attention. 
Somewhere along the line after Vatican II, lay people have been given the idea that a holy lay person is one who is an extraordinary minister of the Holy Eucharist, who reads that Mass. If you are great, we need you. But getting the Eucharist to the faithful is the mission of the clergy. You are helping us do our work, and we are profoundly grateful. We can't do it without you. But a layperson who is living his vocation fully is a person who is taking Jesus and the gospel into the public square. And that's the primary vocation of the laity. And to read at Mass and not do that is not living your vocation. That is the primary responsibility of the laity. So the first thing that must happen to turn the ship around is for us Catholic men and women to take the, to heart the Christ-given privilege and duty to evangelize. For us to accept, to want, to embrace, to interiorize our mission to evangelize. To tell Jesus, I want you to teach me and use me. My great hero, St. John Paul II. I love that man. I pray to him every single day. I entrust my parish and my priesthood to him every single day. And um, he was once asked by a reporter, I think it was a reporter, but he was once asked by someone, um, Your Holiness, can people down in these far corners of the world, rainforests in South America, wherever, who've never heard the name of Jesus, who don't know about Jesus, who aren't baptized, can they go to heaven? You know what his response was? His response was this. The better question is, can those who know Jesus, those who are baptized, go to heaven if they don't evangelize? That's a good question. And so we have a need to evangelize. Second, vision for evangelization. Why are we intimidated by the thought of evangelizing? Father Donio uh, touched on this. Bishops touched on this. Why are we intimidated by the thought? Why do we resist it so much? I have two, two answers to that question. This is what I really think it is about. First, I think uh, much of it consists in this. In our minds, we have made it more difficult and complicated than it is. We have created a monster in our mind. I'm convinced that the work of evangelization is resisted because in our minds we make it harder than it is. The truth is that one does not need to be a scripture scholar, a Scott Hahn, an apologist, a master teacher, a theologian, or have all the answers to evangelize. That's the first. We've made it harder than it is. But the second reason is why we've made it harder than it is. The second reason, the second reason we resist evangelization in my mind is that our hearts have not fallen in love with Christ. Did you hear me? How hard is it to talk about one you've fallen in love with? How hard is that? Carson Wentz, who comes from the Diocese of Bismarck. <laughs> <laughs> In an interview, as you know, he's a, a very devoted Christian man. In an interview, huh, th there was pressure on him because of his speaking about Jesus uh, with class, with uh, teammates, etc., and uh, Bible study and this and that. And in uh, in an interview in a, a Philadelphia uh, ma uh, paper, he said these words: "Quote: You're always walking that fine line, without a doubt." But I always tell people, for example, if you love your job, if you love your wife, 
If you love what you do, you're going to talk about it. Well, I love Jesus. That's what I love. So I'm going to talk about it. He didn't go to Catholic schools. If he would have, he would have said, that's who I love, so I'm going to talk about him. <laughs> but you get his point. <laughs> Dear people, so the question, the question comes down to, have I truly encountered Je Do I really have a lived relationship with Jesus? Do I really know him? Has Pentecost really happened? Do I live in the mystery of Pentecost? Get Peter to evangelize before Pentecost. Put a gun to his head. He can't. Because his heart hasn't fallen in love with the risen Christ. He hasn't met him in that deep way. And so he's not free to evangelize. Pope Benedict XVI, who I trust you all can agree is not an intellectual slouch, <laughs> said this, listen to the, he said these words on October 21st, 2009 in his Wednesday audience on St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Listen to these words, and this is, Father Donio spoke uh, eloquently today about faith. I want to dovetail. Listen to what Pope Benedict says. Faith is first and foremost a personal, intimate encounter with Jesus. It is having an experience of his closeness, his friendship, and his love. Only in this way can we come to know him better. For me, it is no mystery why we don't evangelize. We don't have faith. We have not entered into Christ deeply enough who fires our heart to evangelize. That's what I think. And I dare say, I would like to think St. Teresa of Calcutta agrees with me. This, I read this letter every week. I've been reading this letter every week for a couple of months now. And I believe she is getting at the heart of what we need to address if we're going to, if we're going to live out this mission of new evangelization. Listen, she writes this letter, Holy Week of 1993, to her sisters, her brothers, and her priests. These are people who make a holy hour every single day. They serve the poor day in and day out. I worked with her sisters for two years over in Rome at San Gregorio, this men's shelter, and these little um, sisters from India who weighed 80 pounds would work me into the ground, and I'd have to take breaks, and they would say, oh yeah, brother, you need to take a break. <laughs> I will keep going, but you need to take a break. Okay? They would do all the laundry, huh? all the sheets by hand. Ring out sheet after sheet after sheet by your hands, rinsing and washing them. I thought my forearms got sore milk and cows. This is, anyway, these are incredibly devoted people, but listen to what St. Teresa writes to them. This letter being very personal, I wanted to write it in my own hand, but there are so many things to say. Even not in mother's hand, still it comes from mother's heart. I think she was having a secretary write it, she was sick. Jesus wants me to tell you again, especially in this Holy Week, how much love he has for each one of you beyond all you can imagine. Listen to this. I worry. Some of you still have not really met Jesus. 
one to one. You and Jesus alone. We may spend time in chapel, but have you seen with the eyes of your soul how he looks at you with love? Do you really know the living Jesus? Not from books, but from being with him in your heart. Have you heard the loving words he speaks to you? Ask for the grace. He is longing to give it. Until you can hear Jesus in the silence of your own heart, you will not be able to hear him saying, I thirst in the hearts of the poor. Never give up this daily intimate contact with Jesus as the real living person. Listen to these. Not just the idea. I think we don't evangelize because a vast number of Catholics relate to Jesus as an idea in their mind, not an I-thou relationship that they've been awakened to. She goes on to say, our soul needs that as much as the body needs to breathe the air. If not, prayer is dead. Meditation is only thinking. The devil thinks about Jesus all the time. He thinks about him all day, every day. What he doesn't do is relate to him with his heart and receive love from Jesus. He doesn't bring his need to Jesus. He doesn't get out of himself. That, I believe, dear people, is what makes us hold back on evangelization. We've made it more complicated because we think it's about being intelligent. And we think, it's, we think it's about being intelligent because we have not been captured deeply enough by the encounter with Christ. Evangelization is not about being brilliant. Look at the 12 apostles. It's not about being preachy or pushy. How effective, it is, how effective is it with you when someone's preachy and pushy? Jesus does not inspire us to be preachy and pushy. Unless you're a priest on a Friday afternoon right after lunch. And you got to keep people awake. Listen, it's not about being strange. The faith is countercultural, but not strange. If you look at the Greek, when Jesus sent out the 72, he said, don't take a walking, or uh, no sandals. Or no, sandals on your feet, right? That's, that's the basic only thing. No extra tunic, no money bag. But when you look into the Greek real, real deeply, the first thing he says is, don't be weird. Don't be weird. <laughs> weird Catholics have chased way more people away from the church than the church's teachings ever will. Don't be weird. Weird is not a, a personality trait. Listen, I mean this seriously now. Weird is a moral reality. Weird is self-absorption. I'm absorbed in myself, and I can't actually relate and engage another person because I'm stuck in myself. And so people feel weird. Weird is a moral reality. I'm not talking about being quirky or unique. A quirky person who is not stuck in himself is as endearing as ever. Human formation largely is about getting rid of weirdness. I've said too much about that. <laughs> Evangelization is not about simply being good to people, although that 
goes a really, really long way because God is love. And love is about choosing the good of the other. But it's more than that. But being good to people is a very good start. It absolutely requires being good to people. That's what charity is about. If we're not good to people, we will not be effective at evangelization. But it's more than that, everyone. No one in the Acts of the Apostles is martyred for simply being good to people. They were killed because they proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord. But the best way to facilitate the encounter with this good Lord, this good God, this God who is love, is a heart that's good to another. It's not about simply passing the faith on to one's family. But that's your first duty. Not to evangelize someone across the ocean while not, while not carrying that out to my first neighbor in my home. We got something disordered going on. But it's not simply about passing the faith on to one's family. Before Jesus ascended, he said, go out and teach all nations. Lastly, it's not about something one does for two hours on Wednesday evenings. It's not another task to make you busier. Please hear what I'm saying. Evangelization is not another thing you do. Here is what I want to hold up uh, for my central message. Evangelization is about living one's daily life and one's daily relationships with a further intention. Just a further intention. That in my daily duties, in my daily life, in my daily relationships, I have this further intention to facilitate huh, the encounter with Jesus for others. It's about a sinner who has encountered Jesus and knows him and loves him and is now intentional in his daily relationships. It's integrated to one's daily life. If, it's not get, if it doesn't get integrated into our daily life, we're not going to do it. We already don't have enough time to do what we need to do. And so I find all that's needed to effectively evangelize are two things, to be convinced and to experience, the, and to experience consistently that relationship with Jesus and the church are the treasures of my life. And two, I want others to have that. It's not complicated. To put it another way, evangelization is simply about one starving man who has found where the bread is and wants to help others find it. It's simply about one thirsty man in a desert in the midst of other people dying of thirst, and he found where the water is. The guy doesn't need to know how to bake bread or dig wells. The man simply needs to demonstrate to the others that his hunger is being fed and his thirst is being quenched. It was never meant to be complicated, ever. What I find, uh, perhaps the best way to illustrate the simplicity of evangelization is through the stories in the gospel, in particular the call of Matthew the tax collector. Listen to the simplicity of this story, which is about evangelization. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the customs post. He said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Christ pierced this man's heart. His heart was, was claimed by Christ and followed him. Listen to the next line. While he was at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat with Jesus and his disciples. Not complicated. 
Matthew meets Jesus, follows him, and then at table in his house, he introduces many other tax collectors to Jesus and his uh, 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 disciples. That's the dynamic. Matthew is evangelized and then evangelizes. He meets Jesus and then introduces others to Jesus and to his disciples. Let me emphasize, Matthew did what he had done many times before. He had his buddies over for dinner. But now he had a further intention. I'm not just having them over to drink beer. The desire in my heart is that they meet Jesus. He had a further intention, doing the same thing. He was probably a pretty good host. He liked having people come to his house. His buddies would have been other tax collectors. While in his own personal skills, with his own personal relationships, Matthew evangelized. He hosted a banquet at his house, which he enjoyed doing and probably had done many times before. This time he had this further intention to sneak Jesus in there. That's all that was different. He was being himself. He wasn't being weird. He wasn't being preachy. He wasn't being pushy. He didn't have to become a college professor to evangelize. He did not have to stand on a street corner and speak to strangers. He did not have to go to a third world country. He didn't have to lead a Bible study. He didn't have to be strange. All he had to do was to do what he was already doing with a further intention. So what are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? Hunting? Hunting? If you're a normal guy who hunts and loves Jesus, that's a perfect place to evangelize. Like to drink beer? Like to play pinochle? I'm revealing way too much about myself. <laughs> That's where you evangelize. Here's an example of my own life. One of my engaged couples some years ago asked me to hear confessions at their, after their wedding rehearsal. So I did, of course, the entire wedding party to my pleasant surprise, the entire party went to confession, one by one by one. Later that evening, it was intimated to me that the engaged couple had told their bridesmaids and their groomsmen that for their gift to the couple, nothing would please the bride and groom more than for them to go to confession at the wedding rehearsal. Further intention. They didn't have to sit down and have some clinical conversation about Jesus with these people. They saw this. Here's how we can facilitate an encounter with Jesus. Third, third point, need to overcome. Two things we need to overcome uh, to be effective at evangelization. I, you could probably come up with many more, right? But for me, the two, the two um, most pronounced realities in the heart, in the heart is fear and pressure. Fear and pressure. The spirit of fear, the spirit of pressure. The spirit of I sh must, I should, I have to. The spirit of fear and the spirit of pressure in your heart, you have to get free from in order to evangelize well. So the first thing the guy who's good at evangelizing does is he recognizes his fear and pressure and knows how to receive mercy there from Jesus and brings it to Jesus and begs Jesus to heal the, him of this silly fear and pressure so he can be free to evangelize. He doesn't just put his head down and be a bull in a china closet. He has to be healed like Peter did, and that's what Pentecost did to Peter. We have to get free from fear, the, resist the movements of fear and pressure in the heart, but they have to be brought to Jesus. They have to be related to him. 
or we're going to be preachy or pushy, or we're going to be silent when we shouldn't. We're going to hold back when we shouldn't. When we look at Jesus in the Gospels, fear and pressure did not drive him in his encounter with sinners. And Jesus in you, moving you to evangelize, will not move you by fear and pressure. He will not drive us by fear and pressure. That's not how he encounters sinners. That's not how his heart is motivated. For example, if you start living this and you have someone over to your house, if at some point you feel this pressure and have this thought, geez, we haven't talked about anything with the faith yet. <laughs> we haven't said the name of Jesus yet. I need to if I'm going to evangelize. And I'm going to fail Jesus if I don't, so I better. What you're supposed to do there is don't talk about Jesus. <laughs> you're supposed to say, Jesus, there is some silly pressure in my heart that you've got to free me from. This is not from you. And if you don't do that, then you get weird. What Jesus wants you to do is to tell him to free you from following the spirit of pressure. Jesus, I know that's not from you, but I know you want to use me, but I can't as long as, as long as I have this. On the other hand, if you have someone over and the practice of your family is to say grace and a Hail Mary for grace and to pray for poor souls in the purgatory, but you think this guy might, not, this guy might think that's a little strange and so fear says, let's just skip it tonight. Don't skip it. Be who you are. As long as you're not weird. <laughs> Don't follow fear or pressure. Jesus didn't follow them, and he won't stir them into you to follow them either. In the booklet, I have four practical reasons how to overcome them. I'm going to skip them for uh, this afternoon. Number four, four actions. Evangelization is about leading a horse to water through invitation. A complex sort of reality of invitation. But only the grace of God can make him drink. Only the grace of God can meet him in that beautiful encounter in the heart like Saul who became Saint Paul or what happened at Pentecost or what happened in Augustine in the garden Tole Lege, take and read God needs us to carry out the work of, the, of invitation however now this work of invitation often, often involves more than just verbal invitations it involves four basic actions, four steps that I made up, but I th you, you probably can make up your own. It's kind of fun to make stuff up. But I think they're true. And the four are this, praying about, praying for, befriending. You could probably come up with a better word than that. That's the best I could do. And then accompanying, praying about, praying for, befriending, and accompanying. The one who evangelizes does not decide on his own whom to evangelize. Did you hear me? I don't just decide my brother doesn't go to church, I need to evangelize him. The one who evangelizes converses with Jesus and is prayerfully attentive to who he wants me to evangelize. Jesus needs to lead this good work. So the first step in evangelizing is praying to Jesus about the who. And I don't mean this just in, you know, your holy hour sort of thing. But being attentive to the cashier, Jesus, the cashier. In simple ways, without getting weird. I mean that. But Jesus sends this person to me but he sends another person to you. The more we take this to heart, the more our simple encounters and relationships with people will be seen with new possibilities. 
If you're a construction worker, Jesus isn't going to send you a person who needs a bishop or an apologist, a scripture scholar. Jesus is going to send you someone who needs a construction worker who knows Jesus and loves the church. But we need to pray about who and not just decide with our own ego that I need to fix or convert this guy or that guy. Some time ago I presented these, let me give you an example. Some time ago I presented these four basic steps to this group we started at the cathedral we called the St. Andrew group. Huh? Why? Because of the gospel today, huh? St. Andrew met Jesus, came to Peter and said, we have found the Messiah, and he brought Peter to Jesus. Evangelization. So I was laying out these ideas to this group of uh, uh, parishioners from the cathedral, and I, was, and I said, just, you know, ask Jesus who, you, who he wants you to uh, facilitate an encounter with him, and pay attention to people who come to your mind that you have no reason, that have no reason to come to your mind, that you probably haven't thought about for years, but when you start praying this, this is the person who comes to your mind. Sure enough, a week or so later, this woman came to see me who was at that, and she said, Monsignor, is amazing. When you said that, this per my high school classmate came to my head, and I couldn't get her out of my head. I haven't thought about her for years. And then the next week, or th that week, I ran into her at the grocery store. So we're having them over for dinner. Simple stuff like that. Uh, a personal example for me, a few years ago, business owners in town called the cathedral requesting a priest to come and bless their workplace. So I said, sure. I love doing that. I love blessing the workplace. Very often they give you some cash, so I always take those. <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> so this is an uncommon request. So, so I went, I said the prayers, sprinkled the workplace with holy water, had fun with the couple, um, and uh, I was on my way. Jumped in my car, I checked uh, that off my list, I was on my way to the next thing, and boom, right there. Right there was my, my father, I want more than just you blessing that place. These are people I want to use you with. And so I just started dropping by, out of the blue, four or five times a year. It was, uh, they did pedicures and manicures there. <laughs> so I would walk in, these poor ladies getting their toes done. We're a little, but we had fun. So, focus, focus. <laughs> Just simply, simply going back and visiting them out of the blue, because of this heightened awareness, they started going to mass at the cathedral, even though they could barely speak or could barely understand English. Second step, praying for, after the who is revealed when we then, and don't see these as really artificial, everyone, right? These are just kind of basic, and it's a, a dynamic. After the one who is revealed, we then, after the who is revealed, we then pray for them. We play a role in evangelization, and it's an important one, but not the primary or central one. It is Jesus who has to awaken this person's heart. Jesus who has to reveal himself to this person. But our intercession can give him access, and that's throughout the Gospels. A faith-filled heart interceding enables Jesus' access to encounter a person who didn't even ask. The paralytic, right? When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, The, the, how one of the best examples in our church history is Monica. I love the advice the bishop said to Monica. 
said, Monica, Monica, talk less to Augustine about God and talk to God more about Augustine. Praying for. Jesus, I hold, I hold my brother's heart before you. Encounter him. I beg you. I hold him before you. Encounter him. If you have that going on, that interior with Jesus going on, with the now when you have them over for pinochle, different stuff starts to happen. Befriending. One of the dangers we need to avoid in evangelization is to see the other as another project which I carry out in cold charity. Cold charity makes things difficult, not attractive, not enjoyable, and often not fruitful. And so what I mean by befriending is a certain genuine personal care for the other. That Jesus loved sinners. His heart cared for them. He loved them. He liked being with them. Huh? A genuine personal care, even a warmth, perhaps even an enjoyment of the other. This lifts the work of evangelization beyond cold charity or another project I have to carry out, making it more attractive, more enjoyable, more fruitful. But the fact is, very often, this is a grace that you need to beg God for. So to pray for this warmth. And then fourth, accompanying. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. There are very few people who do not want a close relationship with God. Dear people, there are very few people you'll ever meet on this planet who don't want a close relationship with God if they thought they could have one. There's next to no one on this planet who, if they were confident they could have a close relationship with God, they would have one. This desire is the hook for effective evangelization. The desire for closeness with God, to experience God, to know him in a real way, is the hook for effective evangelization. If I understand the Catholic faith rightly, then I understand that everything in the life of faith and the teachings of the church are about relationship with God. Accompanying a person is about helping them see that. That giving up meat on Lent is about close, is about relationship with God. This is extremely important in a culture that resists institutional religion that resists doctrine, that resists the moral law, that resists authority, that resists the hierarchy. It's important that we use the hook of desire for relationship with God as what leads evangelization, rather than trying to get someone to go to church. I was in uh, a little town, little farm town when I was a young priest and I was having coffee with these farmers after, sun, a- after mass on uh, Saturday night over at the local uh, um, water hole, watering hole. <laughs> um, but, but before, before I, uh, when, when, we were, when we were there, there was a, a guy, you know how, how uh, we priests know this, how uh, guys with, uh, Catholics with certain consciences just throw it out there. So I'm sitting with these guys, and this other guy shows up, he sees me, and within a few seconds, he says, uh, yeah, I didn't go to Mass, my, uh, Father. Um, and then, uh, wh- why do you need to go to Mass anyway? And before I could answer, and I didn't want to have to answer, before I could answer, one of the f- gentlemen sitting with me, I wrote this down, said, For me, having to go is not the issue. I need to go if I want to stay close to God and keep him first in my life. 
If I don't go to Mass every week, if I can't find an hour a week to worship God and thank Him, then sooner or later things take His place. I need to go to Mass because I need and want to stay close to God. That's a man who knows how to evangelize and understands the faith. That's what I mean by accompanying. The key is being able to explain it all in terms of relationship with God. I trust all of you married people, all you moms and dads, I trust if I ask you to explain to me what you do and why you do what you do each day, if I asked enough questions, you could connect it to your relationship with your spouse and your kids. That's why I do it. Evangelization is able to do that with Jesus. This is why we Catholics do what we do, because we want him. He's everything to us. One who's good at evangelization, is good at accompanying another, can do the same thing in regards to their life of faith, being about their relationship with Jesus. I have a lot more to say, but I got to stop. God bless you all.